As an ardent advocate for artists, communities of color, and accessible arts education, Jessica Moss is the founder and director of The Roll Up, a national network of art incubators embedded in neighborhoods, mired in persistent poverty and concentrated disadvantage. By the way, the first Roll Up open house with the next resident, Sean Wallace, will be Thursday, May 23rd, from 4 to 6 p.m., and I'm sure she'll uh, tell you more about that. In addition to her projects that engage art and real property as a strategy of community revival, Jessica is an educator, writer, arts administrator, and consultant. She currently serves as the Director of Development at Black Market Charlotte, a creative studio supporting emerging artists of color in the Southeast, and on the board of the Lorian Academy of the Arts. She is also a member of the Carnegie Mellon University Admissions Council, the National Coalition Black Women's Roundtable, and the Public Art Advisory Committee for the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. And previously, she was creative director of the Harvey B. Gantt Center for African American Arts and Culture. Her interests in innovation, activism, and collaboration continue to influence her projects today. I could not be more excited to bring this true treasure up to the stage. So ladies and gentlemen, here to speak to us on our global theme of water, please welcome Jessica Moss. Come on up, Jessica. <laughs> Let that play for a second. That's so lit. What's up, guys? Thank you so much for being here this morning. This is so exciting. This is a dope room of people. And so before anything else, I just want to acknowledge all of y'all for being here at the crack of dawn this morning. I hope you had some coffee. Thank you for waking up. I'm Jessica. I'm an artist. I'm a civic leader. I'm an advocate for the arts. But most importantly, what I aim to be is a servant leader. Please first, before I continue, allow me to introduce my mom. This is Miriam Moss. She's here. And, and soon you'll hear from my dad, Joseph G. Moss Jr. My dad, who I'll be speaking in partnership with today, unfortunately couldn't be here, and it feels like it's a lesson in fluidity itself, right? I think one lesson that my parents have always taught me is to breathe and then keep moving. So like water, we will also be very fluid today. My dad is a dedicated and passionate leader and advocate for his community. And so without further ado, he made a brief video, which I'm happy to share with you today in preparation of not being here. So Steve, in the back, if you don't mind starting the video and join me in welcoming Joseph G. Moss, Jr. Joseph G. Moss, Jr. Uh, in the background, you hear Fela Kunte uh, with uh, his rendition of Water No Enemy Mine. Uh, and the deal is that this morning I want to uh, address the, about three things. One, uh, I am a currently Senior Vice President of AECOM Technologies, uh, the largest engineering firm in the world. Uh, we in fact, are responsible for more than $20 billion worth of infrastructure work uh, globally. Uh, I now currently reside uh, in the infrastructure uh, division, uh, specializing in water uh, projects throughout the Americas. One of the things that Jess asked me to do is talk about, you know, how you connect, how I've connected infrastructure as a professional uh, to ensure certain services of water are delivered to populations around the world that in fact uh, uh, generates uh, challenges and also solutions to challenges. I, I like to probably think about one thing that I've, over the last year that I, I've been involved in and that's um, the uh, crisis uh, for the city of Flint in Flint, Michigan uh, where uh, my firm was asked uh, to, in fact, repair, replace uh, delivery of lead service lines to residents 
uh, create a program uh, to bring potable water uh, from an existing system, which was Detroit Water and Sewer, uh, back into the city of Flint, and also to look at design of uh, some other um, infrastructure projects, being a reservoir, pump stations, uh, and, and large water mains. I think what is most noteworthy, though, is uh, we were able to replace uh, close to 18,000 lead service lines to 18,000 homes uh, within a period of, of less than uh, 13 months. But also we did it with putting 160 residents um, into the city of Flint um, that basically did two things. One is uh, they had not been employed. We trained them to do the lead service replacement work as well as work side by side with the construction management crew um, to inspect the work that was done and became part of the public outreach, public relations group to tell their residents that the work was being done properly and safely. I, I, think, I think those are the kind of projects that, that, that are gonna happen over the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years in the U.S. because especially in the Rust Belt, lead service lines are everywhere in older cities. And uh, because of the public health issues, they need to be replaced and, and removed. In the global challenge, uh, when you talk about water issues and infrastructure issues, you know, the world population is rapidly climbing to 8 billion uh, individuals living off of infrastructure that was meant for a population of 3 billion people. Um, the, you know, when you, when you look at that, as well as there's a need for $3 trillion worth of investment every year that was first thought of, currently now we believe it should be $9 trillion per year, and from this year being 2019 to 2025 to be able to meet the needs of water systems and other infrastructure systems being highways, airports, ports, telecommunication systems. Jess, you also asked me in terms of how your generation and the next generations can be thinking about these challenges. And, and I think one thing that is critical in not only challenges of infrastructure water, but any challenge that you have, and I've used this in terms of how to address challenges, but as we move forward and your generation and the next generations, I think there's a philosophy and I call it the servant leadership philosophy is leading with others in mind. And what I mean by that is you should value everyone's contribution and regularly seek their opinions. That's what I did in Flint. The one of the critical things that I did early in Flint was I, I hosted a forum of residents because they were so angry and so not trusting of the state government as well as the US EPA because of the poison of the lead service that had leachated into their water system. And so what I, I did is I, I went into the community so that I could get a uncensored view of what their opinions were. And, and, and I did this, and, and what I say to you as a generation of leaders or a generation of trying to make the society better, you have to start cultivating a culture of trust. You know, leaders, and you will be leaders in this group, whenever you talk about creative mourning, those will be the next generation of leaders. Those leaders need to be able to give up their individual power and deputize leaders or others to lead the next generation 
Um, my own experience was I was selected very young to do very large, complex projects. I mean, just before you were born, uh, I, I, I headed up the team to do the first multi-billion dollar transportation project in this country because someone gave me the opportunity. And I say what we have to do in terms of the challenge for the next generation, we have to give them and push them in directions and push your generation in directions to do large, complex projects or programs and give you the opportunity to do that. And you must also do this, and I think this is critical because you see people every day, but you have to help people with life issues, not work issues, because the quality of one's life is more important than any single project we do. Because if an individual and their life and their family is fine, then the end product of work will be fine. And the last thing is think long-term trade-offs between what's important today versus making choices to benefit the future of tomorrow. And you should always act with humility. Can you stop? Just in the background, I've been playing Fela Kunte, Water No Enemy Man. And, you know, Fela says you need water for everything. Uh, and, and, and we agree. But as I conclude uh, my segment and, and talking to you today, I, you know, one of the projects that, that we are doing is SSOM, which is our family's corporation. Uh, we've been involved right now uh, in the Hill District of Pittsburgh, uh, which is where I grew up, uh, where you lived when you were not only at Carnegie Mellon working on your bachelor's degree, but at the University of Pittsburgh when you worked on your uh, professional degree, degree at the law school. Uh, but as you know, we are, we are replacing major uh, water and wastewater lines in the Hill District uh, for the Hill Community Development Corporation. And hence, we are teaching uh, young individuals there, um, young professionals, uh, how work is done and how it's being overseen. Uh, but as you know, we are getting ready to build a new commercial building, uh, which is just under uh, 58,000 square feet of commercial and retail uh, buildings, a building right in the midst of the one of the oldest uh, historical uh, African-American communities uh, in, in the country. Uh, and so with that, uh, as you know, that, that project uh, will be one uh, that coincides with the other projects that, that we currently own in the Hill District, uh, where we put local people to work, and we also engage with the uh, local Pittsburgh Public School uh, and have uh, interns and residents every year. And so with that, I hope uh, this oversight helps you and uh, continue to move forward in Charlotte. Jess, you're doing great work. Love you. Uh, that's the deal. Wow. Dad dropped some gems. Daddy dropped some gems, right? That's pretty, that's pretty remarkable. I saw this young lady taking notes. I hope some of you <laughs> also had an opportunity to write some things down. So dad began with a global perspective, which I think is really interesting. But we're here in a very specific community in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so I'd like to talk specifically about what's happening here. Um, again, Dad began with a global perspective, right? So he talked about things across the world. And then specifically, there was a focus on a national perspective, right, where we talked about Flint, Michigan. And so what I'd like to do is bring us here locally to our specific community of Charlotte, North Carolina. In uh, 2013, there was a Harvard and Berkeley study that was formed, and it found Charlotte, our community, 50th out of 50 in economic mobility. This, this is dead last, y'all. 
50th out of 50, and I find it really interesting when we know statistics, like 50 people move to this city every day. And in addition to that, in black and brown communities that have been previously vibrant, $400,000 plus 1,000 square foot condominiums are popping up on every corner. When the fair market value is appraised at $30,000. So something that my dad didn't just blatantly say, but I feel like is worth it, so I'll say it, is this only affects certain Americans. And this only happens in certain communities. And I think that's worth examining. Uh, before we go any further, when we think about a history of real property, we cannot move forward without acknowledging that in this country, black people were previously deemed as property. And so much of the land that we reside on today was built by this specific population. In addition to this, even after slavery, there were a number of legal mechanisms that were put in place to specifically prevent this population from owning property, right? So we know things like this, redlining. But there are also other legal mechanisms, right? Like racially restrictive covenants, right? Or other housing discriminatory policies, right? Where we think about, I don't know, urban renewal projects, <laughs> right? These things often lead to the displacement of families, closings of schools, and generations of blighted communities. There's a connection here. This is one of my favorite images of all time, Gordon Parks. He took this when he was inspired by a text. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, has anybody in here read this? There's a very specific, that's my gender pronoun. Thank you, Mitchell. <laughs> There's a very specific scene that's incredibly remarkable that's based on an eviction in a black community. If you haven't read this text, I highly recommend it. So dad alluded to my research at the University of Pittsburgh and the School of Law. It's really embedded in the intersection of land, race, property, and the arts. <laughs> so I think that before we go anything further, one thing that I want to say is this project, specifically that's here in this community, the roll-up, is about reclamations. And again, I think it's worth me physically saying this in this space. So the roll-up is a long-term, ethical, community redevelopment project. It's called the roll-up because it has two garage doors. And when the doors are rolled up, it's generally a sign for the community that says welcome. Whatever workshop, event, program, engagement is happening in the space, come and talk to the other artists, the other students, the other people who are participating. The roll-up asks a series of questions, and with so much at stake, the real question is, can arts actually be a catalyst for change? It's really about an investigation of not only how people move, but how resources are gathered, and how collaborations can take place across borders. This is an opportunity to lead with Others, oh yeah, thanks Steve. <laughs> and exactly as my dad just said, activate those six specific strategies of servant leadership, right? So specifically at the roll-up, we host a number of forums, workshops, classes, engagements. We aim to gain trust with the community by cultivating a safe space that is a constant in an ever-evolving neighborhood. We deputize others through professional development and mentorship activities, specifically like our fellowship award, which previously went to Carrie J. King, and in 2019, we'll go to Terry Suave. I'm very excited to announce. 
We employ local MWBE businesses for the entire build out of the building. And a local female architect of color was employed to redesign our space. And most importantly, just as dad said, we engage with local students from the Lorient Academy of the Arts, where I serve on the board, that is focused to providing high quality arts education to middle school students in the west side who don't have access to this in their normal school system. So, in the sake of forums, I value all of your opinions. <laughs> so consider this a collaborative session. Think of what we can build together. And in the idea of water, think not like the drop, but instead the tsunami. Whoa, I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, over 110 of y'all met this guy. You engaged and had conversations with Chun Lee, who held here in Charlotte for six months from Toronto, Canada. Toronto, we got Toronto in the building. <laughs> During his six-month residency, Chung gave nine public lectures. He had talks at the Light Factory and at Davidson, which, by the way, I don't know if y'all know, but Chun is now employed at Davidson College as full-time faculty. So give him up for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. He taught three photography courses at the Lorient Academy of the Arts, hosted 11 studio visits, took 7,000 photos, and this is just some examples of the work that he did. This coming May, I am so excited to announce that Shan Wallace, artist, educator, freedom fighter from East Baltimore will be our next resident artist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you to a very generous hug grant, shout out. Shan was able to come here in December and meet many of you already. Shan's work is specifically about narratives of black life that use collections and archives to tell stories that are often untold. So please, when you see the symbol of the roll up, roll on up on Shan while she's here until November. Like Shan and Chun, all Roll Up resident artists practice a deeply embedded concept of service, collaboration, and community. This work is challenging. <laughs> it's not supposed to be easy, but I make it look good, right? <laughs> Problems emerge, and then they evolve. But I think one thing that's most important in learning in all of this and the one thing, the one solution that's remained a constant is we have to remember to be malleable, fluid, yet confident, and always remember to be like water. Wow, I thought I had that timed well. <laughs> like water. <laughs> I said, empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Be water, my friends. Whoa, it just started raining at that moment. This is awesome. I'm a Pisces. <laughs> so let's, let's keep talking, right? Um, I'm Jessica. This is my contact. My dad's email is somewhere going around in this universe. Uh, you can also follow The Roll Up at The Roll Up CLT on Instagram. Also follow Shannon because she'll be here in May, and this is an opportunity to engage with this artist prior to their arrival. Uh, also, if you want to keep talking in person, on Thursday, the 14th of this month, I'll be at the Black Market CLT in Camp North End, where we'll be celebrating the 10-year retrospective of this local artist, Dammit Wesley. <laughs> so I hope you can join us at 7 p.m. 
Today is the last day for Boom submissions. So if you're interested in participating in the Boom Festival, make sure to get that in today. And Charlotte, thank you so much for showing up. This is so lit. It's so early in the morning. Thank you for being here. I'm so happy to see all of your faces. Thank you to the entire Creative Morning staff. Thank you to Noda Brewery. Thank you to all the volunteers who are here today. Thank you to my mom. <laughs> thank you to Harvey and the awesome band. And finally, thank you to my co-presenter, my dad. Have a great day, y'all. Thank you. Yeah, Jessica Moss, everybody, Jessica Moss.